Hello, friends, and welcome to yet another episode of Impact Everywhere. It is a podcast that searches for people having a positive impact in unexpected places in hopes that it unlocks your ability as an individual to have everyday impact wherever you look. My name is Benjamin Von Wong, and today I'm really excited to introduce to you Sophie Otiende. I discovered Sophie through another podcast guest of mine, Danielle Da Silva, who, if you remember, is an advocate for ethical storytelling. And Sophie, being a human trafficking survivor and advocate, is the perfect person to speak to the topic. Sophie likes to refer to herself as a teacher, a feminist, and an advocate. And for this episode, she dialed in all the way from Kenya. Sophie has some really unique perspectives born from her personal experience, but also the amount of work that she's done trying to learn more about how to authentically represent people who need help. This is Sophie Otiende, guys, and I've just asked her whether or not she has a blueprint for becoming an everyday activist. I think it's interesting that I would say this because I've, I've really been struggling with my faith and Jesus and everything. When I think about activism, I think about what should I do. I feel like the character Jesus is quite an interesting person to sort of study. And it's that sort of start where you are. Like most people, I, th- I feel like most white people know a relative that is racist. Like let's if we're talking about racism. For me, you are much better off educating your relative who's racist than releasing a Black Lives Matter statement. Because I feel that we have the most influence on the people closest to us. We trust them, we believe them. It's easier when someone who loves you holds you accountable as opposed to another person. So for me, Jesus said, start in Jerusalem, go to Samaria, and then go to the rest of the world. I would say start in your own home. Do a personal introspection of what your own contribution to negative things is and start there. You might discover a cause that you feel very strongly about and want to move beyond that. I hate grand gestures in general. I hate it. I think we are ourselves, we are authentic, and we do the worst things when we are in private. It's not in public that the most harm is being done. It's in our private relationships. So if you, do, if you don't start at a personal level to do an introspection, and to ask yourself what your personal contribution is and how you can constantly improve. And then learn. Our generation lives in an age where if you want to find out anything, you have the ability to find out. You have the ability to connect to people that have this knowledge and would be willing to give it to you and to educate you. And then just listen. Some of this also, it's just empathy. Even things like activism, we've really made it so complicated that everyone asking, how? I feel like you shouldn't, like, I honestly feel like the way I responded, the way I became an activist was as a result of my anger and my pain. So the question is, what is making you angry as a person where you are? What is making you angry? And then question that because that's where you should start. Sometimes trying to teach people activism is like trying to to teach people how to be empathetic. And I feel like as a human being, if you see another person suffering, you should just be moved by compassion. So if you are not moved by compassion, ask yourself what is happening to your humanity, right? What is happening to your humanity that you are not moved by compassion? Because in most cases, when you're moved by compassion, that's a place to start. Yeah. I I really love everything that you said, from starting from where you are to also being conscious of your own ego, which is usually where those grand gestures come from. The importance of listening and the what makes you angry part are all really, really great. Being an activist can get really tiring, though. So how do you know when you're doing enough? And how do you keep fighting when you get tired? How do you deal with that sort of pressure of knowing that, like, anything that you do might not actually be enough and that you're really just one small part of a really big complicated puzzle. I think it starts with dealing with your ego. Most of this generation, we are the generation that has lived around awards and being important. A generation that billionaires are being raised up. I feel like because I grew up in a collective culture, 
you are constantly reminded how not important you are and how important you are at the same time. I, I feel like sometimes it's that balance. Like, why do you need to be the one to save the world? For me, that's what humbles me. It's that I don't live in this world alone. It's not my responsibility to be the one to save it. And that's something that I have to keep reminding myself because as an activist, it's so easy to get on that very slippery slope of just harming yourself and even harming the people around you because you're not taking care of yourself. And that's why I go back again to movement building. If you are part of a movement, you recognize that there are other people so that tomorrow if you drop, there are still people who will be doing the work. It's not about you. For me, I'm slowly learning that the best way to move forward is just to remember that it's not about you. You're not that important, but you're also important. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's super beautiful, the, the balance of importance versus unimportant. And I also loved how you have to achieve this inner balance between yourself so that you can actually manifest this outer change that you're hoping to see within the world. So it, it all makes a ton of sense. So we've been talking really, really theoretical right now, and I want to go to your personal story and focus on like how you found like your calling, like how your, your experiences, your anger, and how that led to you finding ultimately your tribe and your movement. So I went through trafficking when I was 13. And I was a child and I knew that whatever had happened to me was wrong, but I just didn't have like the words to describe it. But when I went through this, we were really poor. We were living in a slum. My parents had no way to access justice, to hold anybody accountable. My parents, who are really amazing, they just wanted to embrace me, love me and take care of me, didn't know how to deal with the angry teenager that I ended up being now looking back in retrospect, uh, but they just held space for me. You know, Sophie is just being Sophie. Most of the time, that's what they would say. So by the time I was like 16, I'd already started being involved actively in activism in my community, volunteering, but it wasn't until like I was 20. 28 right I think I was 28 when I found out that the abuse had had gone through had a word and it was trafficking and for me it was so profound it was so empowering because I knew that whatever happened to me wasn't bad luck I wasn't just in the wrong place at the wrong time it had nothing to do with me the focus shifted from me in that moment to the abuse itself and to the perpetrator when I got award for it. And for me, that was a moment of justice. You know, it really was a moment of justice for me because I felt like now I could be able to understand the other issues that surrounded what I went through. I'm also really keen on access to justice and I'm keen on how we define justice because that's the other thing about working with survivors my perpetrator was never sent to jail, will never be sent to jail. And there were so many dynamics around it. That's the thing with most survivors. It's how do you move from that place where something that was making you really, really angry, you can be able to speak about it, you can be able to move forward, you can be able to fight, but you can be able to stand and say, you know, I got justice. And it's not always through the legal framework. And that's why even the whole conversation around defunding the police to me is an interesting conversation because most of us think that justice can only come through one way when justice is very broad, especially when it's de defined by the people that have been abused. I want to take a break from the podcast for just a second to play a clip for you guys about Sophie's trafficking story in a little bit more detail. Because I think we have a lot of preconceived notions of what we expect human trafficking to be. And just to give you a little bit of context where she's coming from, I think this two minute clip will really help. Side note, it was actually shot by the team at Photographers Without Borders. So thank you very much for giving us permission to play this here. My story of trafficking begins with my dad losing his job. He fought that I should go to school, and when we lost everything, he sold the last thing he had, and that was the engine of an old car because I was 
supposed to go to boarding school. My uncle had just come to visit and he was living close to where the school was. So my dad thought, and my parents thought that to save money, they should give him the money that they had just gotten so that he would take me to school. So he took me to his house. It was on a Friday and I was supposed to report to school on Monday. Everything was normal that weekend. Nothing was out of place. I thought Monday I was going to school. Monday came, I didn't go to school. Tuesday came, I didn't go to school. That happened the whole week. Then I realized, you know what, something is wrong. And things are not what I think they are. And all of a sudden, everything that my mother had bought for me to go to school was taken, and they started using it. The next time I asked whether I was going to school, my uncle hit me, and he told me to shut up. So that is just the first two minutes of the video. The entire piece is on Sophie's website, for those of you who are curious. But the reason I thought it was so important to give you this context is because She talks about how important it is in order to have justice for survivors to claim their own power. And that year and a half or so where she had been essentially kidnapped by her uncle, she lost her agency and her status as a human being. I asked her to elaborate a little bit more about her concept of justice, and this is what she had to say. Trauma takes away your power. It incapacitates you. It makes you think you are alone. It excludes you. All these different things. So healing for survivors, being brought back into the community and claiming power is way more powerful than seeing this one person, you know, go to jail for and us spending even money on it. And again, every time I think about the criminal justice system, I'm completely baffled by how it doesn't think about the people that have been abused. Because if you look at how the criminal justice system has been set up, we are giving someone absolutely different who was not in the situation the power to decide whether someone was abused or not. And then survivors are taken through this gruesome interviews where they are attacked and abused, their character maligned. And then after all that, let's say that person has been convicted and is going to jail. It's probably taken like a year of pain, a year of a character that you'll never get back. And you're supposed to be happy that that's justice. I'm just like, no, sorry. And that's the thing. It's like working with survivors for very long. One of the questions that's always important to me is to ask a survivor, what is your definition of justice? Because that's where we start. Survivors start to heal when they see that the person that is there is actually actively trying to get them justice in their own terms. Man, that's super thought-provoking and just another nail in the coffin for the criminal justice system in the way that it's been designed. And it's funny because when we think of this as just normal human peer-to-peer interaction, and it's just funny to me because when we think of this as like a normal human peer-to-peer interaction, you're almost imagining that one solution of suffering should solve all problems. But sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes it's just about being heard. Sometimes it's more about being seen. Sometimes you just want to be understood. Sometimes, yes, sometimes you want the other person to suffer, but definitely not all the time. And this one-size-fits-all solution of justice just really doesn't make sense. So thanks for bringing that up. I want to rewind really quickly, though, for a second, because you mentioned that you didn't actually know that you were trafficked at the age of 13. You didn't have a word for it. So how did you become an activist? Like, what were you exactly an activist for when you were in your teens? I was mainly working, I was mainly working in women's rights and children's rights because that felt like the natural thing to go to. I was also doing disability rights and civic education because for me also politics, much as I hate politics, I recognize I don't have the privilege to disconnect from politics because that's the other thing. If in life you're at a point where you can disconnect from politics, you have privilege. (laughs) Lots of it. (laughs) 
So also just uh, getting to this point, uh, getting uh, talking about civic education and how government needs to be accountable specifically for protecting the most marginalized, which hasn't changed much. Maybe I'm just doing that in counter trafficking. <laughs> Right, right, right. Your reaction to being hurt was to help others. And that was your way to kind of deal with the, the pain and the trauma initially. People have spoken about like this trauma triangle where they say it's very easy when you become someone who's abused for the trauma to make you either want to rescue people or want to hurt people. I feel like I'm lucky that it's sort of pushed me more towards the I want to rescue people than I want to hurt people. Uh, uh, but I think also most of my response was as a result of trauma. Just being really angry that no one rescued me, you know, that no one, no one felt like I was worth being rescued. That's what I felt in that moment. Now I know it's not true, but the that was the anger that sort of fueled me to go outside because it's just constantly thinking how many people are out there stuck in a house being abused and just hoping and praying, you know, that God sends an angel that comes to take them out of that situation. And for me, every single time I work with her, that's what I go. It's like how many times when I was going through what I was going through, I prayed and could not even cry because at some point I lost all my tears, but I was just hoping that someone would come and rescue me. It never truly happened, but I, I eventually left. Even if we have the biggest police force in the world, we'll never really be able to build a system that has the ability to take care of every single person. The only, we only have each other that could do that. That's the truth. So we, we only have, we, it doesn't matter what system we build out there. If we are not responsible people, if we are not kind, if we are not empathetic, if we don't think these values of protecting each other and protecting the world that we have is important, we are going to find a way to bypass the system. We've found ways to do it before. So what is different that's why i talk about that whole personal responsibility because if you become active if you become conscious it means that you're not waiting for the police to come and rescue someone or even if you see someone suffering you know that it's your responsibility in that moment to make sure that that person stops suffering whether it's calling the police whether it's helping out or anything in that moment you recognize that you you have a responsibility Man, it's so profound to hear you speak because although you're telling human trauma survivors how to survive and how to reclaim your own power, I feel like there's lessons in it for everyone because in this day and age where the world is so big, so complex, so convoluted, we often end up in situations where we don't feel like we're enough and we don't have the power to make a difference. But this simple act of being self-accountable and showing up and speaking up and not being complicit with silence, I think is such an empowering reminder that we do hold power inside of us. And it is only in the process of speaking up that we can actually be empowered. I'd really love to take a deeper dive into the work that you're doing right now at heart, because not only is it an amazing story of being rescued by them, then volunteering with them and now working for them, but I feel like there are a lot of different lessons to be learned from just hearing you speak about your approach and strategies and what you do to help other trauma survivors. So HEART is an organization that focuses exclusively on trafficking. It is through HEART that I found out that what I went through was human trafficking. And because they were a small organization, I started working with them to build their protections department that caters for victims and survivors of trafficking to empower them and just to provide care. For me, it's the way it's influenced my work. It's constantly been questioning how I would have wanted if I was a survivor and I was approaching an organization for help, what are the things that I would want them do, to do? And that has really moved me to 
think about being trauma-informed, being survivor-centered. So I'm all about us working with the person who's before us and them teaching us how they can heal because true healing comes from within. None of the services that organizations offer have the ability to give any survivor true healing. That's just the truth. <laughs> the services that we offer are just facilitate, create an environment, but ultimately it's the individual that has to heal. So for me, it's, my personal experience has been that really focusing on the resilience that survivors bring to the table and using that to educate how we develop programs and anything else that we do. And of course, that has led me on like different paths. And that includes things like ethical storytelling, things like standards of care. We live in a world where when someone suffers abuse, we don't question the quality of care that they get. And we almost expect them to be grateful of whatever they are offered. It's like, just be happy. You know, just be happy that you are getting services. There's a lot of, well, good intentioned people working in civil societies and in non-governmental organizations that want to help and want to do all these things. But the problem is most of the time people end up really being condescending to the very people that they want to assist because you have power and you somehow think that you know, you can prescribe, you are an expert to the point that people have become like experts at people's healings and people's trauma. So for me, it's been trying to deconstruct that and be like, I want the person that was abused to be the one to tell us what they need. I want their voice to be the one that we are constantly hearing. I want them to be the one to educate us, to be the one to tell us these are the programs that make sense, to be the ones that are defining justice. I'm only an expert at my own justice. I'm no expert at any other survivor's justice. They're experts in their own justice. And for me, it's just how can I provide room so that you can be able to get that? And that's the work with HART that I've been doing. HART does awareness in communities, does protection of victim, advocacy, research. And I'm in the board now. And then I also work for Liberty Shared, which is an organization that is focused on providing technology to grassroots organizations that deal with trafficking. I'm excited about that because most of the really, really good work is not done by big organization. It's done by passionate, small grassroots organizations. They're the ones that are doing all the, they're the ones who are waking up in the middle of the night to, you know, go to a police station and argue with a policeman to get survivors out of the police station. So I am very, very passionate about small organization and ensuring that small organizations have good system and that their legacy is something that they're happy about. Wow. I think the most profound part to me was when you actually said that we live in a world where... When someone suffers abuse, we don't question the quality of care that they get. And I was just reflecting on my own personal experiences as you were speaking and and actually found that bias to be there. It's like you should be grateful that you have food. Why are you complaining about the quality of the food that you're getting? At least you have something. And there's almost this, this disregard for what people, the, the, the gap between what you're offering and what people actually need. And to be able to recognize that and ask that question, I think is, is super powerful. I mean, overall, I just love that you focus so much on the outcome that you're trying to go after, which is the sense of justice, the sense of empowerment for the survivors, which probably makes you and other grassroots organizations that much more effective. You know, when we talk about organizations that work at scale, it seems like they have a radically different approach. They're not trying to just fix one person at a time. They want to change an entire system. I'm really curious, from your perspective as someone who does work on the ground, how do you think 
you balance saving one person at a time versus tackling the entire framework and dismantling these structures that are generating victims in the first place? I think that most of the time when that question is asked, it's always asked as an either or. <laughs> and I don't think that's the right question. The way I see it is that by focusing on one person at a time, you have the ability to build that ripple to the point that you eventually break the system. I think one of the issues sometimes I have when people talk about the system minus the individual people is we get to this place where the end justifies the means. So, and that's where you end up in a situation where people are not thinking about things like ethical storytelling, because the truth is, if the end is that we have a million people finding out about human trafficking, then it doesn't matter that this one person is not shown in dignity. To be, to be honest for me, it's just lazy thinking, you know, it's pure lazy thinking because there is, I'm at a point where I actually believe that you don't have to compromise one person's life for the greater good. And that thinking, that's the first thing that needs to stop. It needs to stop. I don't care about this greater good if that greater good doesn't include every single person in that picture. It has to include every single person. And this greater good has always been the reason why we've imagined systems that marginalize people. Because at the end of the day, the majority are, are having a fun time. So I think we need to actively start imagining systems, imagining things that include everyone. It needs to start from there. You need to say, why doesn't my imagination include Vaughn? Why doesn't it include him? Why is it that this solution includes X, Y, Z and not that person? So if we start thinking about it, for me, it's not an either or, it's that it's possible to actually achieve both. And we are such brilliant beings. We've gone to the moon, we've done all these amazing things. Why should we limit ourselves in how we think about something like, let's say, ethical storytelling? I see the work that I do as being able to actually break down and challenge systems and do all those different things, even though I'm doing that work to one specific person. And I think even the fact that I'm speaking to you is evidence that clearly does something. Because if what I was doing was just impacting the two, maybe or the 100 or 500 people that had has assisted, but you wouldn't be interested in talking to me if I hadn't done what I was doing. So mm. I, you wouldn't. So it means that whatever I've done to that one person is what has led to me having a conversation about systems, about how we can actually break them. And I, can, I have authority in saying, this is what I think because I have actually done it. I have a problem with people coming to give us all these grand ideas that have not been tested. So, yeah, that's why I think it's not an either or. I think you can be able to do it all. That's so beautiful. And I actually love how uncompromising your view is on it. And you're right, though. We need to be uncompromising on these kinds of things, because if we give ourselves the option of saying, oh, yeah, either you help one person or you help everyone then we're just going to take the easier route all the time. And that insight on this is the very definition of how marginalized people get marginalized is, yeah, that's it's so profound. When you talk about saving people and healing them and helping them through their trauma, these are all very qualitative things. I mean, you might have a quantitative number of people you've helped, but how do you go about measuring impact? How do you know if you're being as effective as you want to be? Like, how do you combine all of these different components together? And what have you found to be effective when communicating the value of the work that you do? When you think about culture, you have to go back to how is culture lived? How do you define culture? So if we go to that, if we go to culture is music, culture is narrative, culture is language, culture is values, culture is all those things. It's I go back to those things, have values shifted. 
do I see values shifting? And the answer is yes. Do I see the narrative shifting? Is yes. I see then a few years back, no one was talking about things like ethical storytelling. Now everyone is talking about ethical storytelling. A few years back, no one was talking about uh, the inclusion of survivors' voices into the movement. That has become a thing right now. If you move from defining what culture is and saying that culture is all these different things and looking at when I started, this wasn't happening and now this is happening. We have more and more people aware and talking about the issue of trafficking, questioning things like supply chains, like forced labor, like holding companies accountable. People are talking about responsible investing. These were not things that just happened we are shifting the conversation because we are debating, we are talking to people, we are showing people that if you do this, you achieve this. So for me, it's it's that. But most of all, it's in how we also relate with each other because that's where any abuse that we are trying to rectify is happening in our communities. So for me, the conversations happening in communities, the accountability systems happening in communities is much more important to me than anything else in terms of are we shifting culture. Right. But but then when you want to raise funds from investors or anything like that, you have to say, as a result of the work that we've done, this is, you know, it's a super narrow focus and you almost need to do this dinky translation, which doesn't capture the value. How do you actually portray the change that is happening to say, yes, your money is going to a good place. How do you translate this, you know, this notion of community transformation? The only way you get people to understand anything is through stories. And to be honest, I think the only way we change the world, the only way we, we teach is through stories. And that's why I'm very invested in telling stories and telling the right stories because when you actually show someone and you tell someone that five years ago when we went to this community it didn't have this it didn't have this and now after the work that we've done these are some of the things and these are some of the stories that are coming from the community people can be able to actually envision and see the only way you get people to envision change is through stories and that's why storytellers are the some of the most important people out there because they determine the narrative. They determine eventually what people learn. They determine who gets to be seen as a savior, who gets to be seen as a perpetrator. When I say that, it sounds like, oh my God, but yes, people have to be responsible when they're telling stories because at the end of the day, it's stories that touch people and move people to act or not act. So for me, the way I do it is mainly through stories and mainly through talking. And even our conversation right now, to me, feels like part of that storytelling, part of me giving the, your audience a chance to listen to my story, to listen to the story of my community, to listen to the story of the work that I do, because the chance to encounter my story is really very little. It's so funny how everything always comes back to story. I go about this podcast trying so hard to figure out these different metrics and numbers to measure it, and it always boils back down to stories. So, okay, in that case, if story is your most effective weapon, tell me, what are the elements of a really good ethical story? What kind of guidelines should people be aspiring to follow? First of all, it's understanding what your responsibility as a storyteller is and the power that you have. And I think without that recognition, it's very easy to make mistakes. The other thing is a question of whose story. Constantly criticizing and asking whose story are you telling and why are you telling it? And then whose story is missing? which voice is missing why have you chosen to include one voice and exclude one that sort of gives you perspective because once you understand who the story belongs to and whose voice needs to be centered it's your responsibility as a storyteller because you know what power you have and it's your responsibility to then shift it to the person that owns that story because the story, in most cases, doesn't belong to the storyteller. And it's the storytellers that get all the different things. They get all the awards. But if it is not really your story, 
the power of how it should be told, how it should sound and everything should not belong to you. I think it's to remember that. When I say storytellers, all of us are storytellers, but we have people who are paid to tell stories. So I feel that I should say specifically some of this advice is for people who are being paid to tell stories. Because in most cases, you are being paid to tell stories that are not your own and you need to be responsible. So good. I think all of that is super helpful to our listeners over here, because at the end of the day, every single person has the capacity to tell stories all the time. And even if you're not paid to do it, I think the same rules sort of apply. I think we're running out of time over here. So I want to end on one last question. If you could tell the world to change one thing, like imagine you had a microphone to the world and you would invite everyone to change one thing about themselves or do something differently. What would that one thing be? Oh, that's a difficult question. (laughs) Oh my God. The one thing. I think it goes back to empathy. I think one of the most powerful things that I've, I found out was about Einstein's tree of life. And it sort of talks about how everything is connected. So when you understand that you are not like this molecule that is existing in a vacuum, that you're connected to every single thing, you're connected to the environment, you're connected to your fellow human being, you're connected to animals, you're connected to the sea, you're connected to everything that is happening. So for me, if I was to tell people is if they could just recognize how connected they are to everything, and then, of course, act from a place of understanding that because of that connection, if they do anything, it has a ripple effect of changing everything else. So your actions don't just affect you. Your thoughts just don't affect you. Your thoughts and your actions affect the people around you. They affect the climate. They affect the environment. They affect the ocean. They affect all those different things. You'd live your life a little bit differently. You'd be a bit more responsible. That's a great piece of advice. I'm always blown away how I might be able to walk in a room years later from a project and someone can come up to me and say, oh, that thing that you did so long ago, you don't know who I am, but it really made a difference in my life. And I'm just like, what? How? How? And and that realization that all these individual tiny little actions that we do really add up and are all connected. So it's really our responsibility to show up the way we hope others will show up for us. It just sounds so simple, but it's actually really, really hard to practice. Anyway, Sophie, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop rambling now. If people want to learn more about what you're doing and how they can help, where should they go and discover more about you? Heart have a campaign right now. They just launched it yesterday and uh, specifically for the work that I used to, uh, I spoke about assisting victims of uh, of trafficking especially right now during the pandemic like everything else when you think about like life and you think about if there's a pandemic, the people that are most affected are the most vulnerable people. So, of course, victims of trafficking have been affected by COVID-19. And they've put together a campaign and you can go and actually donate and assist us to be able to raise money so that people can, uh, we heart can continue assisting the people that we do. And it's running until 30th of July. 30th of July is the World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. I just recently launched my own website, but yeah, if you want to hear me ranting, I've put, I've also put uh, my website. I have a few blogs up. There's a video of my story and I'm going to be updating a lot of the work that I have done and continue to do there. All right. Wonderful. That's H-A-A-R-T. For those of you who are trying to figure out how to spell heart, make sure you go check it out, be generous, donate, because Sophie is doing some wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you so much for taking the time to share. And I hope that some of these beautiful ripples you're putting out into the world come back to you one day. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for giving me a chance to talk to people. (laughs) All right, guys, that was Sophie. You can actually go to her personal website too to learn more about what she does. That's Sophie Otiende, O-T-I-E-N, 
Drop her a line or send her a tweet. She is super friendly and always willing to take the time to help those in need. If you feel inspired, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts if possible, because those small little tiny five stars really make a difference in helping us hopefully get discovered and making this a little bit more sustainable. Next week, our guest is Nora Rahimian. She is a culture hacker and Although she has extensive experience in social services, went the opposite direction of Sophie from counseling individual people to helping shift culture through arts and specifically music. She has some really amazing points on risk and privilege. I think it'll be a great one and I can't wait to put this piece together and share it with you. I hope you guys are enjoying things so far and I look forward to seeing you next week because impact is everywhere.